All right, so hello everyone, Nicholas here today, and uh, I'm joined by Michael Lesner, uh, who is a very interesting individual, right? So he, he's an attorney, advisor, board member, subject matter expert in space law, space policy, lawfare, hybrid warfare strategy, and outer space security. He's also an author and publisher of the Tracy, right? That's, uh, yes. we're going to talk about that, that one as well. Uh, very interesting. So Today we're going to be discussing everything about the uh, space law and the, you know uh, policy and regarding the you know corporations and now looking also forward into you know how the space exploration is going to turn out you know with the lunar settlements just being you know uh, a few years away and then you know Mars settlements being like you know decades away as well so looking forward to that horizon as well so mm -hmm. hi Mike once again and a uh, pleasure to have you likewise thank you for having me. Perfect, perfect. So let, let's start from the very beginning. I mean, Michael, so what motivated you to specialize in space law and policy? And how do you see the field evolving in the next decade? That's that's my question to you. Uh, space has always been a, a big fascination of mine ever since I was a kid uh, and growing up. And then I got into law school and I had to write a paper for one of my classes, international law which kind of for most of my grade in that class. And I said, you know what? Everybody's writing all, everybody else is writing about all these other interesting areas of international law, but I'm going to do something different. And I said, I wonder what, what about what there is about space law. So I started doing research and I wrote the paper. I got an A in it and I got, I got published as well as, as a student. So that really kind of, you know, sprung me into, you know, the interest of space law as an attorney. I spent a couple of years after that, you know, just thinking about the issues and really started becoming forming the foundation of being a subject matter expert in about 2011 when I when I formed my company, Space Law and Policy Solutions. I started doing a lot of writing, uh, getting published online, and uh, I just started gaining basically notoriety for you know being the subject matter actor, so this go-to person in a sense for uh, this idea of space law and policy. And you know, the big thing is about this, this is, a whole, this is a really evolving area. It's a really emerging area. I mean, people talk about cyberspace and, and, and AI being emerging area, areas of law. Space law really is an emerging area as well. There's, there's you know, we, we have these foundational laws, but we really don't have rules or standards or practices that really firmly in place. And there's a lot of groundwork to be covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's very interesting. Because 30 years ago, Michael, if we were to mention space law, I mean, there was not even a profession, let, let, let alone like a service, right, to to really provide that to, you know, companies yes. and governments and organizations out there. Uh, obviously, we had the international laws that, that, that were agreed upon, but those, as we see, also are not anymore to, you know, they need a lot of updates and, you know, they really need to be uh, adapting to the current landscape and the, some of the, you know, exciting mm -hmm. projects that are coming up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and again, so you mentioned that's uh, that's how you got, right, into the field. So what yes. what are some of the things that are changing currently in, in, in space law? So when, what do we expect to see changing mainly? Where is the focus currently uh, for the... Well, right, now, right, right, right now, the big, the big, one of the big biggest roles is on the role of uh, what, what I call non-governmental private companies like commercial companies. Okay. Uh, yesterday, if I'm sure everybody was watching uh, SpaceX launch in their oh, yeah. monster Starship rocket. And even though it was a failure, you got to understand this was a private company that did this. And he has big ambitions about going to Mars. He also has a contract with NASA to land a variation of Starship on the moon uh, in, in the mid 2020s. So the whole I, this whole idea, this whole paradigm of of what I call non governmentals or private companies being involved in space is really, you know, tasking what space law and really a lot creating more rules or, or basically creating no more standards of practice as we move along. And there's really a lot of unknown territory as we move forward because technology, just like we see in computers and AI, technology is moving moving really at lightning speed, and the law really is struggling to catch up. So I mean, fundamentally, a lot of the, a lot of the rules, a lot of the uh, emphasis of law, which I think is at mostly at the at the domestic level, is about you know how are we going to you know regulate or basically you know kind of um, guide these these non governmental agency uh, companies that are going out and expanding at at, at lightning speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that that that's uh, very important because now we see like by today there's 
statistics out there that you know around ten thousand companies are contributing to the new space economy, uh, mm-hmm. from the private side, right? Which is again a huge number, huge increase from what we have if we go back like ten years, right? Ten years back, so right. a, a mm-hmm. lot of new activities happening, and very important again to regulate that. So one of the questions that I have. Uh, for companies that are, let's say, in the you know satellite, uh, you know operators, uh, if we're talking mm-hmm. regarding them, or if we're talking about the launch companies, right, the launch providers, right. uh, there is a whole lot of regulations that they have to deal with, right? So mm-hmm. uh, to to be able to successfully even carry out their missions and get the permits and licenses from right. the, the missions. So how how complicated of a process that is, Michael, for them and does space law solutions help them overcome those problems? Well, it's, it's basic, basically what happens is under international law, under one of those foundational treaties like the Outer Space Treaty, there's basically a permissive nature which says that not these private companies can participate in these activities, but they have to be authorized and supervised by the state. So in other words, a company like SpaceX has to receive a launch license from the U.S. government, in this case, the FAA, in order to mm-hmm. launch a satellite to launch one of his rockets, like his big monster rocket yesterday, it yep. needed a license from the FAA in order to do that under, you know, under that international responsibility. Um, satellites, on the other hand, satellites that, that deal with communications, you got to go to the FCC. The FCC handles the licensing because that deals with spectrum. And spectrum is a whole other area that's that's adjacent to space law that, in fact, in fact is tied to space law that is critically important because Spectrum is something that's internationally regulated under treaty, and the FCC has a responsibility to apportion that to private companies to con- be consistent with international law, because spe- Spectrum is a very, very finite resource. Mm-hmm. And all those, all those we, have, uh, we have these satellites that we, we call in geosynchronous orbit, those slots are very finite too, and they have to be, re- they have to be apportioned um, fairly too, because there's only a limited number of those as well. So... Basically, how difficult is it? Well, it depends on the state. It depends on the country. Like the U.S., for example, the process is fairly complicated uh, because one, if you're going to launch, if you're going to launch a satellite, first you got to go to the FCC mm-hmm. and get and, and get their authorization, and then you got to get a launch license from the FAA in order to in order to put it in orbit. And if you're going to have a camera on that that's going to look back on Earth, you got to go to the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric administration to get what we call a remote sensing license so those big those three in, in the sense where a satellite has communications a uh, uh, visual uh, camera function and and such you need to have three different agencies basically sign off on it and oh, that's one of the big things that that the national space council have been taking up to how do, how do we how do we make this a little bit more less complex mm-hmm. more 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 user friendly for this and I mean, for for big companies like SpaceX and, and the the big defense contractors, they ha- actually have whole departments dedicated to just processing mm-hmm. these licenses. Mm-hmm. But for the smaller ones, it's it's very time intensive and expensive because they got to go to people like myself or other attorneys to actually and then pay out the money to actually get these licenses processed and go through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I imagine it's very tough for them. Just simply, you know, it, it already takes a whole lot of time to develop again your satellite or payload whatever uh you're you're developing your mission then it takes you time to really book the flight and you know until you book the flight you have to already wait for this permits to be allowed and then you have to wait for the launch schedule to align again with your mission so it it, it costs them a lot of time, which again, time is money for them since, you know, they have investors waiting for them and, you know, they have to make profit, you know, and, it, it, and so space companies, the thing is you have to make a lot of profit. You cannot just, you know, be cash flow. Right. You have to be making a lot of profit to be able to be, especially if you're venture backed, right? So you have exactly. To, yeah. And that's, a, that's the difference between private space and government space. Government space isn't there to make a profit. Private space, they are they're in the business to make a profit. They're not gonna they 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 can't function like the government because they can't afford to function like the government. They have to they have to do it differently, mm-hmm. but they are subject to the government. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it would be amazing again if, if this process can become also uh easier for, for them. But again, they have uh, an option to obviously always come to you, Michael, right? So uh, mm-hmm. how would it work? So basically they come to you with their okay, this is my mission plan, this is my design, right? Uh, and uh, then which licenses would I need? So they come with you with a question, right? 
Yeah, and basically they ask me, well, what, what am I going to need? And, and there's a lot of concern. And I tell them, well, well, you're going to need a launch license to begin with. And even even if you're not going to, even if you're not going to put a communication satellite into orbit, you're still going to want to talk to that satellite. And so you're going to be using the spectrum. So you're going to get have to get a license from the FCC. And I said, oh, by the and also if you're going to put a camera on this, it's going to look down on the Earth. You're also going to have to go to NOAA to get a license from them as well. And you have to put those all together and get and get the, get all those approvals. And then you got to hire. Then you got to go to a launch provider. You got to find a launch provider and and basically enter a contract with them, um, and obviously pay some fees up uh, ahead of time or pay for it all at once, and basically be put on the manifest. And you got to and, and and smart launch companies will make sure that will will want those assurances that you've gotten all your permits in order before they'll even manifest your satellite on, on their rocket. So my job is to basically guide people into this and say, look, you got to be able to, you know, the, this is what you got to do, and this is what you got to pull together, and you know, this is this is how the process goes. It's and it's kind of cheerleading a little bit in the sense that you know what, this is going to take some time and some effort, but we can get there type of thing. Now, another issue is if people want, you know, if people want to, you know, launch on an overseas provider, a company like like Ariane uh, or 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 such. Basically, you know, we have there are export rules here called, and basically under ITAR and ITAR basically says you got in order to basically export some sort of satellite or rocket technology outside of the U.S., you got to go to the State Department and basically get a permit from them saying this is OK. Likewise, if you're going to have some, if you're going to be launching somebody else's satellite, that's, you know, from from a foreign country, that you got to you got to talk to the State Department as well and get some sort of permission, or at least communicate with them as well on that. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a lot of paperwork involved. There is a bureaucracy. Like I said, there is there is there is an effort in place to try and streamline this right now, but I'm not sure how far it's going to get at this moment. But this, but in the case of the, in the case of the United States right now, there are three what I call authorizing agencies: FCC. NOAA and the FAA. Those are the big three. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, and, and then let's say there's a company, uh, a startup, you know, that really is chasing that, you know, holy grail of, you know, space companies, which is government contracts, right? So mm -hmm. uh, does your uh, company as well, Michael, so does Space Law Solutions actually help them and assist them in, you know, qualifying for government contracts and handling the paperwork for that reason? Right. And government contracts is different because you're actually launching for you're providing a service directly to the government. So you don't need so you're not going to go through the necessarily go through the FAA for that. You're not going to go through the FCC either because mm -hmm. the communication, the communications for, for government is basically handled differently. It's like it's handled, handled what we call the NTIA um, that, that basically deals with federal use of the spectrum mm -hmm. um so that's a whole different ball of wax altogether versus a private a private rocket launching a private satellite for a private mission mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but but does again space law solutions assist them in, the, in this process yes we point them in the right direction where we don't have expertise in that we point them to the proper professionals who can mm -hmm. who can help them navigate the uh the uh intricacies of government contracting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes that's right Okay, so, so so my next question, Michael, to you is obviously, you know, everybody's seen this news with the, you know, Chinese balloon, or, you know, that, that was again uh, flying on top of some of the uh, sensitive areas, uh, as we mm -hmm. can call it. So uh, that has been then, you know, uh, shut down and taken down. So uh, wh what's your take again on that situation? I mean, completely. So is it uh, is it legally, uh, you know, uh, punishable for, you know, uh, countries to violate again the you know, privacy like that of other countries or, or you know, insecurity, or is it, you know, uh, not justified for them to really take it down? So what's your take on that? Uh, bottom line is, in my opinion, the, the overflight was a breach of U.S. sovereign airspace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there there, there's, there was a lot of talk out of, um, there was a lot of talk in the in some of the space law community that, you know, this altitude of the balloon hat that was, that was basically no man's land. And, and I disagree just because, you know, we have we have a lot of history. There's a lot of history in international law where that's proven been proven opposite. For example, um, there was a U2 spot. There was a U2 plane that was shot down over the Soviet Union back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, and it was traveling at basically the same altitude that balloon was. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there have been other reconnaissance flights you know, made by the U.S. over over territory that has been claimed as sovereign territory where, you know, there have been missiles actually launched on on the aircraft. So really, this whole idea that, you know, this, this altitude above 60,000 feet is basically no man's land is wrong.
However, yeah. once you get into outer space, I mean, to the point where you're actually making one complete orbit of, of the Earth, well, then you're in a whole different territory altogether because space is sovereignless. Nobody owns it. And I can I can legally fly a reconnaissance satellite over your territory so long as it's in space. And there's nothing you can do about it legally. You could probably take a shot at it, but you'd, you'd be violating international law. But basically what we call free access in outer space. Um, and that was actually and that was actually a principle that was um, created by Sputnik 1 when back in 57. Just a little bit of history here. Prior to that, Prior to Sputnik, there was a lot of speculation about space law and what was going to, you know, what was going to happen. There were really no treaties or really no rules. There was really no state practice. And the Eisenhower administration basically had this idea. We want to we want this idea of free access over outer space in outer space because they had this idea of reconnaissance programs like we have now with satellites. But they didn't know how to do it because, they, you know, because of the political situation, the heat of the Cold War and such. When the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, before they launched Sputnik, they were basically saying that outer space, we own outer space from the ground all the way up into outer space above us. So in other words, they were claiming outer space above their territory. Mm -hmm. When they launched Sputnik 1, Sputnik 1 start, went up, it went to orbit, and it started passing over the territory of other states. So in, in essence, under their theory, they were violating um, so they were violating the sovereignty of other states. But here's the key. States and no states, including the United States, didn't make a big deal of it. We just said, OK, that's nice. And, and really, they did us a big favor because then the Eisenhower administration came back and said, look, oh, the Soviets just demonstrated this, this principle of free access to, of outer space. In other words, you can pass satellite over somebody else's territory so long, so long that it's in orbit because it's a sovereignless area. And that became ingrained in what we call customary international law. So right. that that was a huge thing. So so long as something's in outer space, yeah, yeah, traveling in orbit a, above a country, they really legally they don't have recourse against it. They can't really complain because it is a rule of international law. Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah interesting because uh, and, and what what happens regarding the space debris, Michael? So when when we're talking about anti satellite testing, so obviously that being prohibited like internationally. Right. And still some countries like Russia, for example, lately, they have, you know, done several of those. Uh, is, is there any, uh, you know, legal consequence or punishment that can be imposed by international partners regarding that or how, how, how does it work? No, not because the outer space treaty itself doesn't prohibit the testing of weapons like like the like, like the Russian ASAT test. And here's the here's the here's. And here's where we get into, into into semantics and words and how how you how you coin these things. When when uh, November twenty first, twenty twenty one, when the uh, November fifteenth, twenty twenty one, when the sub Russians performed this de performed this in uh, action on one of their own satellites, everybody was pumping up, including the United States, as this was a test, and that basically put everybody into legal limbo right now because it, it was a test. It really didn't violate international law. It didn't violate the Outer Space Treaty. There's nothing we can do about it except get you know get angry and wag our fingers at them, and that's basically all everybody did was wag their fingers at them. Mm -hmm. However, you know my my thoughts on it were it says look instead of calling this a test, call it if you call it a test, there's nothing you can do. But if you call it a demonstration, you may have legal recourse. So let me explain the difference between a test and a demonstration is in a test you're seeing a state is seeing if it can if it has a certain capability if it can actually do something. A demonstration is actually showing, is basically showing you or showing everybody else, this is what we can do. Mm -hmm. So my my take on this is if you, if you change the narrative on this to this was a demonstration, you may have had legal recourse or at least the ability to say they violated international law under the Outer Space Treaty. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the narrative got so stuck that this was a test that everybody got trapped into it and there was no legal recourse whatsoever. I see. Yeah. So, so everything is in the details, basically. So those small. It's it's politics and semantics. How you how you how you frame these things. Mm -hmm. So, so speaking about politics, uh, Michael. So, how how does like geopolitical situation affect generally the uh, outer space and you know space missions and exploration generally? Oh, it, it it's basically it it really is overarching in this in the sense that it right. is without space policy, you don't have space law. Space policy basically is, you know, this from this perspective of the U.S., the first space policy was in 1950, in, in the early 1950s, I think around 1956, and that was during the Eisenhower administration. Mm -hmm. 
basically these documents are online. You can actually look at them. You can look at them and you can see what the concerns of the, of the administration are. And basically the idea behind a space policy from a national standpoint is we would, we have an idea on what we want international space law to look like. And so when we go out to functions like the UN yeah, nations, we're going to basically promote internet, we, what we believe international law should look like in terms of outer space. And, but, and that, that, that shaping has basically shaped the outer space treaty. And it's basically given us the ability to have what we do, what we do right now, the capabilities we have right now in terms of even commercial space, because commercial space is a huge space policy um, uh, matter. Uh, back in, the, in, in fact, starting in 1984, the Reagan administration with this national space policy came out and said, we want commercial entities to, to start participating in, you know, as, as private operators in outer space, of course, subject to our oversight and subject to international law, our international legal obligations. So it was a national space policy in 1984 that really started this whole thing of commercial space in the United States off uh, to the Point where it is right now and each successive administration has built on that um promoting commercial space in their space policies i mean space although space policy would come back and easily say well you know what we don't want commercial space anymore i'm not saying that's going to happen but a space policy could say that and, and could could either slow it down or stop it in its tracks mm -hmm. i mean another another area of the space policy really comes into play is settlement i mean we hear a lot of talk about settlement of the moon uh musk wants to go to mars and sell mars that's great, but until until the U.S. government, until Congress or the executive branch comes out with a with a policy that says it is it is a policy of the United States to allow private settlement of the moon and other planets, it's not going to happen because again, the government is over has overall um, authority over the government all the all these non governmentals and what they do. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense. Yes, yes, it does make sense, but also uh, it, the fact itself doesn't. So basically, well, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, how do we ensure now moving forward, right? As the, you know, uh, generally, because those old laws, they're being decided by states and by UN, right? So how mm -hmm. do we make sure that the private companies are also part of those policy discussions and part of the discussions on the space law, you know, changes that are happening mm -hmm. uh, as we move forward again in this hybrid type of space economy? Well, they do. In fact, you know, the state, the state department frequently puts out, you know, re requests for, mem you know, representatives of the commercial space industry to come in and actually, you know, consult with them when they go to the UN and basically and to, you know, help advise them on, you know, how we should, you know, how the U.S. should approach this area of commercial space in the in the international arena. I know the National Space Council has a, what they call a users advisory group which is comprised of a lot of non-governmental entities to come in there and advise the National Space Council, which will in turn, you know, basically um, percolate up to the State Department and help in their consultations in the international arena as well. So, yeah, the commercial space has become so prominent and important in, U in the U.S. that they do have a voice in, in, in uh, basically assisting the U.S. in promoting commercial space in the international arena. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's uh, that, that's awesome again that the companies they really get to say a word and you know we've seen this with Artemis Accords as well, right? So they mm -hmm. uh, pretty much you know uh, with the Artemis program they had a lot of say and a lot of participation as well uh, for mm -hmm. the companies themselves. Uh, that's that's awesome to see. So when when we're talking about the you know settlements and you know Moon and Mars, so okay, you you mentioned that you know the state has to come out and you know clearly state that you know they approve this and you know it's part of their policy right but mm -hmm. when we're talking about resource utilization for example on the moon mm -hmm. right because the international space law tells us that you know nothing is can be owned by any state or any individual or a corporation right that's outside right. of planet earth so how, how can those amend you know changes be made well the changes are already being made back in 2015 uh congress passed a space resource law which basically says any private entity that goes to the moon or any of the celestial bodies and physically removes resources, whether it be water, regolith, minerals, what, what have you, they can, they can make that personal property and they can sell it and do whatever they want with it. Mm -hmm. Now that was basically a very interesting interpretation of the outer space treaty because, and, 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 and the idea is from that law, from that domestic law, uh, the U S has been promoting this abroad in, in the UN. 
Since then, several other states, including the United Arab Emirates, Japan, Luxembourg, and, and a few others have actually created their own uh, space resource laws domestically, which mirror the U.S. law. In fact, there is a mission by uh, that was launched by a private Japanese company. In fact, it was Japanese who were the first licensed to a company to actually go to the moon and retrieve regolith that it will re that it will bring back to Earth and actually sell to NASA. This and will that would be, be iSpace, right? Yeah, and the, they're actually supposed to, it should be landing any time now, from what I understand. It's been in flight for about six months. So that's going to be a huge thing. So when that happens, when 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 money exchanged hands and they NASA gets that regolith, basically we've, we've created what we call a state practice for this idea of space resources. In other words, it's just not an idea or a theory of what international law is. This is actually, we are actually enacting it through an actual real life practice, which is going to give that idea of space resources more roots in international law and make it more viable. So the same thing with the next mission that happens, the next space resource mission that happens. It's going to go there and it's going to harvest it. And once it sells, once it sells the material, that's going to create even stronger roots for the idea of space resources. And you see the acceptance of this, like in countries like the UAE in mm -hmm. the Middle East, who have their own space resource law. Um, you have People will say, well, there is this idea of the moon, the moon agreement and such. And, you know, the problem with the moon agreement, which basically says, well, we need this big international organization like the International Seabed Authority to basically regulate, you know, the harvesting of resource uh, of mineral wealth on the moon and other planetary bodies. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of it doesn't have a lot of signatories. In fact, Saudi Arabia, which was which signed it just a few years ago, actually announced that it's going to withdraw from the treaty mm. in, and that'll be effective next January. So, and, and in my opinion, that's because they're moving more towards the idea of space resources. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, there. Granted, there's a lot of pushback in in the academic world um, about this idea of space resources, and they've been saying we need to enact the, uh, you know, we have we need to enforce the Moon Agreement. But, you know, when countries like the U.S., the Russia, Russia, and China are not haven't even looked at it, um, chances are it's really not going to win out in the end. And I think space resources through consistent practice, through these consistent actions of going out and harvesting them, is going to go, gain international acceptance very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's great to see again that those changes are being made and, you know, the community, you know, is being welcome and open again to to har harvesting the, you know, resources and being able to use and, you know, repurpose those and sell them even uh, potentially. But but what, what happens when, again, we are in that slightly scenario where there's a clash of interests, right, regarding the same Again, resource, for example, you know, uh, mm -hmm. source, right? So, how is that being addressed? For example, okay, we're on the moon. There's, you know, United States, you know, uh, representatives. It's a private company or it's a state, mm -hmm. you know, NASA, for example. Uh, and, and then we see there's, you know, like Chinese national, you know, space, uh, you know, administration, and they can, they both want to have the same resource. I mean, is that being yeah. split? Is that divided? Is it first come, first serve, or? How, how does that work? Well, that that's the big question. Nobody really knows yet. There's a lot of yes. ideas on what what's going to happen, and people and, and there's a and for that reason, there's a lot of rush that we have to pre-regulate these things. And but I'm kind of a, a, of the opposite um, opinion. You know, people people say that you know the people are saying we we want we, we want this you know to be a very clean process, a very orderly process. Yeah. I've always thought that the, that the best rules are made once you hit, when, once a mess is made. I mean, you know, it's it's easy to preconceive what, how an activity is going to happen, you know, here in front of my desk or in a in in a boardroom or in you know in in a room by a bunch of lawyers. But it's another thing to actually find out how an activity is actually going to take place. And until you really know how an activity is going to take place, you really don't know how to properly regulate it. And on top of that, I think you know, bottom line is. I think companies in in the long run will figure out their own rules. They'll, they'll figure it out for themselves and have their own understandings about this, and create their own norms of customary international law through those activities. It's very, in fact, in fact, here on Earth, it's very common for companies um, doing transacting international business to create their own norms of customary international law through through their activities without the involvement of governments because it's good for business. And you know, because it is business, you know, they're Good business deems that you know we should try and 
work with each, you know, work with each other and stay out of each other's way instead of fighting with each other all the time. So mm-hmm. bottom line is, I think, I think, I think resource extraction and like works like that is going to be messy at first, but that might not be a bad thing because out of it will become some good guy, some ideas of, okay, this is something we got to look at it. Maybe we should make a rule about it instead of saying, you know what, we'll make a rule about it right now and tell them how they should do it instead of letting them figure out how they are going to do it. Mm-hmm. So, so basically, we're taking the approach of you know, okay, let let's not, uh, you know, let's make a bunch of mistakes, basically, and you know, uh, see where that leads us to, you know, what's going to make sense, right? With a well, I don't know, it, the, you know, there's those two competing schools of thought, uh, the pre-regulating yeah. and and the wait and see, mm-hmm. like myself, they haven't really decided yet because yeah. we haven't got to the point, but it's coming quick, and I, again, I think the law. The law is going to be a little bit behind, but in my opinion, something like this, the laws always should be a little bit behind because the law can be too constrictive sometimes and prevent activities from happening in the first place. Mm-hmm. So, so, so another thing, uh, another question that I have. So, uh, I have, was having a conversation with one of the individuals, uh, Pam Melroy from NASA, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, she she mentioned that uh, currently NASA and you know the Artemis partner states, you know, they're uh, collaborating a lot with you know cultural and you know other type of institutions that you know they talking about preserving lunar mm-hmm. cultural you know and not damaging any sites on the moon or you know basically right. that, that's uh that, that was the narrative that that was being discussed so do you believe some of those things that you know could be pre-regulated could really prevent companies and states from carrying out their missions i mean do should we really be that considerate of those issues uh, of you know not damaging the environment to some case, right? Mm-hmm. Or should we really focus on accomplishing the missions and really exploring and finding what's out there, right? Well, you got with the moon in particular. There's a lot of cultural significance to to many cultures. I mean, even you, even our culture here in the U.S. I mean, I like to look up the moon when when it comes out. And the question is, how much you know? Do you, you need to basically take you take into consideration what you're going to be doing to the moon when you perform these activities. Mm-hmm. Then, then from a historical standpoint, you got to look at things like you know the Apollo landing sites. You know, there 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 are still there's still hardware there, and there's but more importantly, there's there's actually the remnants of of human activity in in the footprints, mm-hmm. and you don't want to you know stumble you don't go walking into one and basically step on Neil Armstrong's footprint just to say hey I you know I stepped into the one first step. Uh, just you know, just to satisfy, just to satisfy a life uh, bucket list goal. Mm-hmm. You those types of things, you know, you might want to say, okay, we're going to agree that we should just stay out of these and leave them be because they they have historical significance. So I mean, and there's also archaeological significance of you know the artifacts that are still up there. I mean, there are actually people who actually do this field of space archaeology as well. Um, so yeah, it, it is it is one of the considerations that has to be taken into account. It isn't just carte blanche. We're going to go up there and we're going to start mining the moon. And you know the heck with everything else. Um, we got to we got to take these other considerations um, as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a that's a fair point. So so coming back a bit to some of the most more stressing and urgent like issues that we currently have, which is the space debris and you know the Kessler Science Syndrome. You know, mm-hmm. just being around the corner. Uh, I had a chat with a, a representative from European Space Agency Space Debris Office. Uh, mm-hmm. He said Kessler Syndrome is already begun. Uh, meaning that you know uh, those collisions are already, already out of control. They're you know happening all the time, and you know that's significantly growing the amount of space debris and also affecting the orbits that the space debris are in. You know potentially mm-hmm. creating new threats. So it, it, and then we on the other hand take a look at all those plans to launch tens of thousands of satellites, right? So I think the number is mm-hmm. hundred thousand plus satellite, yeah. hundred seven thousand satellites over the next decade. Yeah. Right, so that that's a lot, right? So looking mm-hmm. at the current state. So what are some of the you know uh, regul regulatory side and you know uh, with the, for example one thing that that I heard about is the zero degree policy that's you know has been you know advocated to be enacted and I think it has been accepted uh, already mm-hmm. I believe. So what are some of the things to actually prohibit that type of use of the space? So I mean you cannot really prohibit a company or a country to launch additional satellites because right. that's you know violates the fairness that violates all the main you know points that there are but but mm-hmm. you also cannot allow them to really turn you know the the orbits into the no-fly zone right so how, how do we tackle this that's that's the question 
Well, the FCC already deals with this because they, like I said, they license these mega constellations to mm-hmm. begin with. And as part of that, the SpaceX has to sign, had to fill out, basically prepare what they call a space debris mitigation plan. This is actually in the regulations themselves, mm-hmm. basically saying you've got to have a plan for when once these satellites die, you got to have a plan to get them out of get them out of orbit. Mm-hmm. And that plan, that plan has to be presented to the FCC, and the FCC has to sign off on it before they give them a license. Now that plan is all is always a work in progress. It isn't just one and done. The FCC is going to consistently look at this to make sure you know to to see if it needs to be modified. And SpaceX continually has to modify it. Amazon's another one who's going to be doing one of these mega constellations, and they had to they had to go through a similar process and offer a similar mitigation plan. So that's how the FCC is tackling that now. Some people some people talk about you know employing what we call the National Environmental Protection Act. Which is basically an environmental law that that, in my opinion, doesn't apply to outer space. Um, it was actually litigated uh, a few last year, and basically, you know, uh, it was one company that said, you know, the FCC needs to be applying what we call NEPA to these evaluations, and um, the federal court basically the, the federal court basically danced around the issue uh, of it and didn't even address a core issue of, of it. But fundamentally, you know, uh, you have two sides. One says that NEPA should apply. These these environmental reviews need to be performed for satellites. But the people like me who look at it and said, this isn't what the law was intended for. And this gets back to the pet peeve of, you know, space is an evolving area. It's, it's really its own unique environment and it really isn't terrestrial. You know, you can't use laws that were written back in the 70s to address problems of a new century. Mm-hmm. You know, and this is the idea where, you know, we have Congress that has to basically, if Congress, for example, if Congress wanted NEPA to apply to satellites in outer space, then NEPA, then then Congress has to get in there and basically amend that law or else write a whole new law uh, addressing environmentalism in outer space. So it's really, it's really a tricky, tricky issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's, and it's very, a very political issue on top of that. And you'll get, you'll get different, inter- different answers depending on who you talk to. Mm-hmm. And then we have basically that regulated. Okay, so you have to meet this end of life, you know, the orbiting mm-hmm. situation, right? Uh, but what happens in case, uh, you know, is there is it possible to also regulate that all of those satellites that go into orbit, they have to have some sort of maneuverability, right? So that they are able to avoid the coming threat threats of, you know, space, you know, collision potentially uh, and uh, are those companies actually obliged to work together with the space situational awareness data provider yeah. companies well actually you know com- companies have been more proactive in this without mm-hmm. the government stepping in companies you know have basically for example when when uh, when satellites are launched the upper stages are fre- frequently save enough fuel in order to either put themselves into you know outer you know deep outer space itself or to actually deorbit them, deorbit themselves within mm-hmm. a relatively short period of time, um, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have these things called space debris mitigation guidelines, which basically says, you know, F, uh, a, t- a satellite must be able to deorbit after twenty five years. Although the FCC came out and said it now, now it's going to be five years. Yep. I don't know how how whether they have, legally have the authority to do that or not. That remains to be seen. But I we find that companies understand that instead of you know the government jumping on their back and telling them to do it, they have a vested interest in, in start doing it voluntarily and setting setting their own standards and setting, instead of letting the government set the standard for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Makes sense. Okay, so there is no legal way to really, okay, regulate that from a state perspective. Well, they, 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 they're, they'd have to write the regulation. They'd have to write the regulation. And again, it, will, it, it depends on whether the agency writing the regulation has the authority to write that regulation. And that comes from Congress itself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, makes sense. Okay, so from your perspective, Michael, so, you know, working again with your clients again for all these years, uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that, you know, typically your customers they're facing and uh, how does space law solutions really help them overcome those? Well, well, obviously the biggest issue is getting through the licensing hurdles. Um, okay. A lot of people, a lot of people come and talk to and, and talk to me about, you know, they have these grand space ideas and I say, Okay, that's great. You know, the you know, basically based on what, what I know you want to do, this is what you're gonna to have to do. This is you know, you have to go through this process. But really one of the biggest issues right now is funding, you know, getting okay. capital to actually do the perform these. I mean, rockets are very, very it's a very expensive thing. There's no such thing as cheap rockets. There's less expensive rockets, but there's no such thing as cheap mm-hmm. rockets. Um, Elon Musk, SpaceX, they have brought the cost of 
of you know launching satellites down significantly, but it's still expensive. Uh, you're, going, you're, you're paying millions and millions of dollars just to get your satellite in, into orbit, depending on the, si the size of your satellite as well. And reusability has kind of, you know, brought that cost down. Um, and, you know, if you go to Musk and ask him how much Starship costs, well, it's going it, to that launch yesterday cost him a lot of money, mm -hmm. you know, and just building it and fueling it. And uh, but, you know, that it's part of the process. So really, the biggest thing is funding. And, you know, uh, back in January, Virgin Virgin Orbit basically had a failure in when it launched from UK, and that put a put a big damper on on basically this private investment because people were very discouraged about it. On the other hand, you have you know launches which were spectacular yesterday, like the uh, Starship full stack launch. You know stuff like that actually motivates uh, private investors to put money into this. So it's a, it's a very from from the investment from from a uh, a company standpoint, the hardest thing is finding actual capital you can get some from the government you know if, if you if the government is interested in your project but you know the the big part is get, getting these venture capitalists to actually you know invest in your company usually giving them the equity interest in in it and um the big thing is you know what kind of return they're going to get on it so a lot a lot of it's financial but a lot of it's emotional you know emotional as well based on what events like you know the virgin orbit failure or you know you know motivating factors like the uh spacex launch yesterday Mm -hmm. Especially the Virgin Orbit, I mean that that came at the peak of this recession, right? Which you know we've seen in, in last year, the investments have halved pretty much. Yeah, it, I mean it, it, there were there were a lot, you know, there were a lot of issues, you know, with these things called SPACs. You know, there was a big spree of SPACs, and there were but there were a lot of launch failures. Um, uh, Astra had a rough time with, with it with its rocket, yep. and now it's building a bigger rocket, and that that discouraged investors, and it hit its stock pretty heavy too. Um, but you know, I think the Virgin or, Virgin Orbit. Um, mishap basically you know was kind of you know a, a big downer it didn't it didn't help things and they, they were already going in a downward direction however you have launches like yesterday's which says oh wow even though it didn't get to didn't get into space itself that was spectacular they got it off the pad and they're moving forward this is exciting this is something I, this is something i want to be involved with and that might encourage investors mm -hmm. yeah i mean the, 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 that's the hardest part getting them getting them up once you have the once you have the funding the rest of it falls into place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so when we're talking about uh, some of the like emerging fields at the moment, right? So we're talking about space tourism, right? So how does that differ? Like human space flight providers, private companies, how does the regulations that they have to meet differ from, let's say, the companies that are just sending payloads in space? Well, right now, uh, they're they're a whole because. Space tourism involves actual human beings. There are going to be different regulations. Mm -hmm. And uh, at this point, we're, we're in what we call a moratorium, where the FAA really can't heavily regulate, can't introduce new regulations into the industry. And that moratorium is going to end on in October of this year. So the big question is whether Congress comes back and, and reinstitutes a moratorium, whether they're going to say to the FAA, okay, now you have the authority to go in and start regulating as you see fit. And in fact, the FAA already has a draft plan on regulations that they're going, how they're going to um, approach this. But the question is, you know, whether or not this, whether or not Congress says, you know what, we're going to, we're going to extend this for another five or 10 years, this moratorium or not. They, now those, those regulations are, are going to be more specific because they deal with human, human space flight. But what's launching up, you know, what's launching a payload, an inert payload, like a satellite that's launching on top of a rocket, those there are different regulations in there, you know, obviously ground safety, you know, you know, you know, how insurance requirements, what have you. And of course, you know, meeting all your other standards for performing your whatever activity you're going to perform in outer space, because there's no humans involved, those regulations are going to be less stringent, as opposed to what human tourism would might encounter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's uh, that that makes sense, and that that's right. Uh, my, my my next question is: uh, I've just been thinking since we talked about the spectrum mainly in the beginning, and and then we talked, you know, uh, regarding the uh, so spectrum was the main discussion. So what what if it's not a you know a communication satellite and it's a you know Earth observation satellite, which you discussed mm -hmm. a bit about the camera? So how do governments and how does the the law and regulations really make sure that you know? It's not some sensitive information that they're acquiring of, let's say, some government-like security-based, mm -hmm. uh, so again, uh, locations, or if it's right. if nobody is violating again any individual private property. So, how, how is that being impacted? Right. Well, actually, no. A few years, uh, 
a couple of years ago, revised their, their regulatory strategy based on what type, what types of observations were going to be made. In other words, if you're going to be making an up, and the whole idea is, you know, access is the the U.S. government is concerned about access to this imagery data, but whether whether a foreign government, you know, hostile to the U.S. could actually purchase this imagery. So basically, what what this tiering system looks like is, the NOAA says, okay, show us what are you going to do? Are you going to basically just take photos, uh, images from or from outer space that could be obtained anywhere that, that are really low really low value? If so, we may just require a few regulations. However, the more sensitive, the more sensitive the type of data or uniqueness of the of of the imagery that is planned to be acquired becomes, the higher up the tier that goes in terms of regulations, it might be a little bit more regulatory um, implementation on it. Saying, okay, you're going to, okay, you're putting in a new camera, you're putting in a new camera system that's going to have offer a very unique opportunity. We're going to have to, you know, put a little bit of, of we're going to want a little bit more oversight on this because of, you know, the imagery uh, that you're going to acquire. So this tier system is designed not to make to basically make it more flexible for potential uh, operators to get a license. In other words, real simple to real complex um, will depend on the regulatory framework that is required. Mm -hmm. and, and then as we talk again, the artificial intelligence and other, you know, emerging technologies that are involved again in processing, for example, this big data that's, you know, coming through from, again, this observation. So uh, as I understand, they're not also fully allowed to fully just, allow, you know, leave it up to the AI. So you have to double check and go through the checking processes when before they actually deliver the data to the customers, right? Uh, again, depending on, depending on the sensitivity of the data and the type of data being required, uh, mm -hmm. no one might do that. I mean, you have commercial satellites right now who are actually provide, providing imagery to the U.S. government, to the intelligence agencies. The government has become a customer of these commercial imagery services. Um, and, and that type of, you know, the, and again, depending on the sophistication of those types of um, imagery, uh, they may be a little bit more restrictive on, you know, who who get who gets to see it and who doesn't get to see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that makes sense. So, so, so for the next thing, uh, you know, Michael, I'd really love to discuss the pre-C that you published. So maybe you mm -hmm. can tell us a bit more regarding that. I started the press seat back in June of 2016, and basically it is a, what I call a briefing letter. Okay. I look at all, I look at area, different areas related to space that I find, I consider are important. And I basically provide summations of them. I cover U.S. domestic regulation. I, I cover national security, geopolitics. Um, uh, foreign foreign policy and legislation, domestic policy and politics, regulation and licensing. These are, if you look at my letter, I mean, right there at the beginning, you have all those headings that I cover, and I look for, and basically I gloss through information that I that I find, and I basically summarize it and provide my own little analysis for it. it it's a subscription letter. It's a, it's a paid subscription letter that I send out via email. Um, and basically, it's four quarterly issues, and the quarterly issues range from anywhere from sixty pages up to a hundred pages. Um, the last, the last one I did for first quarter twenty twenty three was about seventy pages. So, it's a very, um, it's a very finely focused, very quick, nuanced area. I'm looking basically me taking a snapshot of, of of the world and space, and basically digesting it down into these quarterly briefing letters for my subscribers in order to inform them what I think is important going on in outer space and giving my insights and what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that, that, that mainly involves, as you're mentioning, you know, the app, your analysis on some of the updates and, you know, some of the topics that are really you know, Correct. hot at the moment, right? Correct. Okay, perfect. So yeah, that, that makes sense. And, and the ideal individuals for that would be, again, the startup founders, you know, the founding team, uh, and just the lawyers that want to keep up. Or anybody, or, or anybody who's interested in, you know, what's going on in outer space. It isn't so much, it isn't so much all about rockets. It's about, you know, what go, goes behind the scenes of rockets, you know, the regulation and such. I mean, I have subscribers who are individual subscribers. I have people, you know, there, there are people in government who subscribe to my letter. Uh, there are people in the media who subscribe to my letter. There are people in academia who subscribe to my letter. And uh, so it's basically, you know, it's for the person who wants to know what's going on and wants to know what I think about things.
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Makes sense. And, and again, for the audience that's listening to this, so they can find your pre CEs at, at you know, uh, spacelawsolutions.com. Right. So yeah, spacelawsolution.com. There, there's an actual page for, for the pressy right there. And there's a link to my email if you want. To, I offer a free sample copy of the prior issue for you to give you a look, let you take a look at it. And I, I have subscription options, whether you, you can pay me by, by credit card or PayPal, those, those are the two options. And depending who you are, you know, I, I have very, I have tiers of subscribers. Individuals are 199 a, for, for a year for four quarterly issues. Academia, military and government is about 25% off that price. And I have other, other special deals that I can, I can, I can arrange as well. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And, and for the companies that are looking again, that are currently in the licensing process or are looking to get into the licensing process, you can always, you know, reach out to Michael and, you know, Space Law Solutions at spacelawsolutions.com. Uh, you can, you know, reach out there directly to Michael via, you know, phone number or, you know, email or just send them a contact uh, message as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Michael, we'd love to get your final thoughts. You know, well, what are some of the comments that you foresee again happening and do you believe people should pay attention to in the field of space law and regulations? Well, definitely pay attention to what SpaceX is doing because Starship, once they get, once they work out the bugs, it's going to be a game changer in terms of, you know, how we do government space, uh, non-governmental space. It's very, what happened yesterday was very, very significant. Watch, um, you know, issues of space debris. Those are important. Keep an eye, keep an eye on ICE, the ice space mission that, that the Japanese company is performing. Mm -hmm. That's going to, if that's successful, that's going to be hugely significant as well for international law. Um, space tourism, I think, is going to be less and less important as we move through. But what's going to become more important is the idea of private astronauts and private space stations. Um, mm -hmm. The ISS is getting near the end of its life and NASA is looking for a way to replace it. I think private space stations are the way are are the wave of the future, but again, you got to have in order for that to happen. Congress has to basically get get on the stick and actually create the laws that said yes, non you know, private citizens can create these private space stations. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what you're going. I think those are the important things to watch in the future. Mm -hmm. So thanks for those points. And again, uh, I, I was planning to take it to a conclusion, but now since, since you mentioned some of the things. Uh, I think we'll go a bit deeper on those as well. So as we're talking about those private, you know, stations and, uh, you know, structures that are being developed in the, you know, orbit uh, and they're used for, let's say, commercial use, right? So if we're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, uh, either like manufacturing, like in, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, you know, low gravity, micro gravity out there, or if we're talking about, you know, just the tourism destinations, right? Like space hotels, mm -hmm. which there, you know, we, we all know there's been some, plans proposed by 2027 right. which this timeline is unrealistic like from my right. personal opinion but even though i mean that's a good you know start right to to really propose and set this you know deadline for themselves so that's uh that's a good one so how do you see that playing out and especially i'm very interested in the process of having employees out there right because you have to have a staff uh, mm -hmm. they're full time actually, or you know, well, yeah, pretty much full time. Uh, if you want them to be able to, again, if it's a hotel or if it's a manufacturer's, uh, then they have to do this, right? So, what happens in the case of you know, again, them deciding, okay, they don't want to work anymore, right? So, you have to now set up a mission to bring them down, or you know, mm -hmm. you, you you cease paying them, but you know, you still have to provide them with the food and you know the supplies to you know make a living, but then why do you have to do that if you if they're no longer with you? So what, what's your take on those some of those questions? And maybe you have some other points you want to bring out as well. I think I think what the, the the question you raise actually raises a lot of questions and a lot of issues that have to be you know looked at seriously and mm -hmm. and addressed. Is is now the time to do it? I don't know. I think what's a lot's going to happen is when when those when when that reality start when when those ideas start becoming real reality those issues will start being brought up and start being addressed more coherently. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I really don't have a lot of opinions on it right now because I haven't really thought about those issues. Again, it's one of those things, it's not a hot, but it's not a hot topic issue for me immediately mm -hmm. because I don't see this happening in, you know, in, in the next time, yes. You're right. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to just go, you know, deep and just dive yeah. topics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the most, most unlikely scenarios as well, but you know, you, you never know what's going to, you know, spit bump you uh, in the future. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it's just like you know, people talk about you know, well, we got to have we got to have a Mars constitution. I, I I don't I really don't care about Mars right now because we haven't got people there yet, and we haven't we haven't settled Mars yet. That's mm-hmm. probably you know half a century, probably to a century down the road. Uh, I'm I'm dealing with. I tell people my my focus is dealing with getting getting from here to there, everything in between, because you got you got to fill in everything in between to get to there. Mm-hmm. And what's your take, Michael, on the planetary protection policy? Um, that's, that's, ba- that, that's been around for a long time. I mean, that's basically a treaty requirement under the Outer Space Treaty that is enacted domestically. NASA's had it for ever since the Outer Space Treaty has been in effect. Um, again, uh, these things get revised every once in a while. Mm-hmm. The latest one is the latest one I think might be a little bit restricted towards, you know, uh, commercial aspects, but mm-hmm. I think it's one of those things that will be modified as we start, as activities start, um, ramping up on the moon itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, because again, that's one of those points that I personally believe could be, you know, stopping, you know, companies and states from executing some of the necessary activities, right? Now, understand, planetary protection is twofold. You also got to protect the Earth's biosphere. NASA has a a sample return mission from Mars being planned right now. So in other words, you're going to be bringing actual material back to the planet Earth. And so you got to take into consideration proper protocols to protect mm-hmm. the biosphere from anything we, we don't know what's living what might be yeah. living in there. and That's you don't right. want i mean there was this great movie called life where they were they returned a sample to earth and they had this had this alien entity called calvin mm-hmm. and that i watched that movie and that just kind of freaked me out it's like mm-hmm. oh that yeah just imagine yeah. if that happened here on earth yeah that that, that makes sense actually but but, but uh, when we're talking regarding let's say okay protecting the earth is you know okay that makes sense right so when we look at protecting like Mars and the moon from being contaminated from Earth life, right? So what's your take on right. that, that side of thing? Well, the protection, you know, the, the, the protection is twofold. I mean, I talked, I heard some people talk about this a few years back. And basically the way they looked at it was, you know, the moon is basically dead. And so, and basically asteroids are dead. Well, However, it's good to... that we can say that about the moon, right? But with Mars, it gets a bit tricky, right? Because we, we don't fully we, know. We don't know. But understand, you know, planetary protection isn't about ethical, you know, the ethical considerations or the moral implications. Mm-hmm. It's about preserving these areas for science. Okay. Uh, planetary protection was was designed specifically with the, uh, for outer, for the other planets, was done specifically to preserve them for science, not really for an ethical or moral purpose. Mm-hmm. Okay, makes sense. Okay, perfect. So th- thank you in, in that case, Michael, again, for, you know, answering all, all the questions and providing this great insights. For the audience, again, they can follow uh, Michael and, you know, Space Law Solutions at spacelawsolutions.com. Uh, and we'll be staying again, you know, tuned for, you know, some of the new thoughts that Michael will be putting out in his pre as well. So we'll be all staying tuned to that. Thank you for having me.